scripture. And now that's always the goal. It is how we grow as believers. It is how we are set apart from the world as believers. The more and more we uh, listen to the word, the more and more we understand it and not just the truths of it, the more and more we begin to mature in our Christian walk. And so that's why we don't take these opportunities lightly. So I want to thank you guys for coming out. It's good. It's good. I want to thank you guys uh, for joining us on Facebook uh, and all those who may view it also on YouTube. We want to always welcome you as well. Uh, our goal tonight is to conclude our little short uh, series we've been doing. So uh, from 1 John chapter 2 is we've been expositing these verses. And uh, that's always the goal, to allow the verses to speak to us and uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to talk to us. And we begin to kind of say some things about them. So I want to go to 1 John. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. Let's look at it all together. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And today we'll look at verse 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. So that's where we've been for these past three weeks. And uh, I want to kind of conclude the teaching on today. So it says here in verses 2, through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, and the desires of the uh, of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. That's like I'm getting enough feedback, so it probably just needs to be cut down just a little bit more. It's not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with all of its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's good. So that's been the kind of verse that we've been talking about. And, uh, you know, just to kind of give you an understanding, when you think about 1 John, 1 John is written, one thing about John, the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, he also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and we know that he's also the author of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the last book in the Bible. But one thing about John, what I like, what I like about him and his, uh, and, and when he does his teachings is, or when he does his writings rather, is that he always gives you the purpose for why the book is written, and that, and it's a, and it's good because it gives you an an overall uh, a, a roadmap of where John is going with his teaching, and so in First John he says that these these things are written so that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, in John, in the Gospel of John, he says there in chapter 20 that these things are written or these signs were performed by Jesus so that you may know that he is the Son of God. You see that? So in other words, the Gospel of John, the entire book is written for us to know that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. Well, 1 John is written, the entire book of 1 John is written, so that we may know that we have eternal life. And so throughout the book of John, the epistle of John, he gives these proofs on what it means to know that you have eternal life. And so one of the proofs is what we just read in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. That's one of the proofs that we know that we... Uh, are part of the kingdom. And so one of those proofs is that we do not love the world or the things in it. And so that's a, that's how that's a good understanding of how you have to approach this book. And so we're going to talk about the third and final part of this uh, passage of scripture by John, which has to do with the believer's relationship to the world. And what we discovered is that it is our association, it's our relationship with the world that causes us to have a difficult time accepting where our world is heading in these final last days of human history. And what I mean by that is, as we walk through these things in Scripture and as we go forward and we begin to see where things are going, we discover what the Bible is telling us, where the end of time is going, the end of the age is going, and we find ourselves... Uh, uh, you know, uh, with messages that are dealing with that, being disappointed. You know, we can find ourselves even find maybe depressed because you say, man, this just looks so bad. Where's the good news and all of this? We can find ourselves feeling discontentment. We can find ourselves feeling frustration and distractions. All of these things can begin to rise up in the believer as they are living out these last and final days 
uh, uh, of man's kingdom. And so what we kind of discover with this series is that the reason why we feel those disappointments, those that depression, that uh, uh, dis discontentment, frustration, distractions, all of that is a byproduct of the believer's life in the believer's life because of a wrong relationship that we have with the world. And what I mean by that is when we say a wrong relationship, we're talking about an unbiblical view of the world, an unbiblical view of the world and how the believer relates to the world. We have to begin to develop a biblical view of the world and our relation to it. And when we don't have that, we're going to find ourselves being disappointed depressed, discontented, frustrated. We're going to find ourselves distracted. Why? Because we don't have a good relationship with the world, meaning we have an unbiblical view of it. Okay? That's what I mean by that. And so what did we say in the first message? We said, well, what was the world? We took the time to define what is the world. And we said the word there for world, when it says do not love the world, the word there for world is cosmos. Cosmos is exactly where we get our English word cosmos from. And what a cosmos is, it's an ordered system. The word cosmos is an ordered system. We get it from the Greek word cosmos. That's an ordered system. The universe, despite all of its vastness, all of its expanse, is a cosmos. What does that mean? The universe is an ordered system. As opposed to a chaos. It's not a disordered system. And so when we think about that, it gives us an understanding of what we mean by the world. The world here, when John says, do not love the world, he's not talking about the world of creation. He's not talking about the world of humanity. He's talking about the ordered system of evil that influences the affairs within creation. Within humanity. Do y'all understand that? He's not talking about, do not love the creation. Like hate trees, hate the animals, hate just hate the earth. That's not what he's talking about there. Because the earth is a part of God's creation. And we are to love it. We are to love it. As a matter of fact, God put man in the garden and he put him as a to be responsible for the creation. He's also not talking about, you know, do not love the world. Okay, don't love those sinners. You can't love these sinful folk. You can't love all these politicians, man. You don't know. No. That's the mission field. We love the world of humanity. <laughs> because we're there to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. So John is not talking about that. He's talking about this ordered system of evil. And on last week, we really took some time to go over Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And I'll read them to you, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, because I think they give us a really good view and understanding of the world there. It says, And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I think that gives us a good overview of what we mean by the world. When we say the world, we're talking about, it says that we all were once, before we got saved, we were dead in trespasses of sin. We once walked or lived our lives following the course of this world. What did we say the course is? The course is made up it's the ideologies, the attitudes, the norms, the values, uh, the opinions, the philosophies. We all follow that. That's why we said if you want to do what the devil says to do, just follow the world. Whatever the tide is in the world, if you do that, you will be successfully following Satan. Because he is the prince or the ruler of of the power, that word power there is authority. He is the ruler of the authority of the air. The air there is the air we breathe, of the atmosphere of the world. Satan is the ruler and the authority 
of the atmosphere of the world. Satan is the ruler and authority of the entire systems of the world's attitudes, thinkings, thinking, ideas, concepts, all of it. Satan is the ruler and the authority of it. And not only is Satan the ruler and authority of the world, he is also the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So Satan is the spirit that's at work in all unbelievers. All unbelievers, Satan is the spirit that is at work in them. Oh, now hold up here, Pastor. Are you saying all these unbelievers are demon possessed? See, that, that's because we have a wrong view of what we're talking about here. Satan is, is the ruling authority of the attitude, of the opinion, of the ideology, of the philosophy of every single unbeliever. He is the God of that. As a matter of fact, first, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelievers lest they believe the glorious light of the gospel. Well, how has Satan blinded the minds of unbelievers? Notice he blinds the minds. How do you blind a mind? You deceive it. You confuse it. You distort it. You pervert it. How about we use an all-consuming word? You corrupt it. And that then blinds the minds of the unbelievers so they will not receive the glorious light of the gospel. He can blind the minds of the unbeliever because they believe an ideology. And then now when they hear something in the Bible that goes against what they believe, then guess what? They're going to reject that. I don't want to hear that. That's why I don't really go with that Christianity thing because all that stuff is just, uh, you know, uh, is just trying to uh, control people. All that stuff is just, uh, you know, religion is the opium of the masses. And, and man, you know, uh, you, you guys are just being duped by, 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 by some book written by men that's thousands of years old. It's outdated. That's an ideology. That the world has, and that's how Satan blinds the minds. Do y'all understand that? Satan doesn't blind the mind of the unbelievers by keeping demons in the house. He blinds the minds of the unbeliever by keeping them following the course of this world. Okay? So, we said as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot love the world, number one, because of who rules it. Why can't we love the world? Why can't we love that ordered system? Why can't we love the world's ideologies, the world philosophies, the norms, the values? Why can't we love those things? Because of who rules it. Jesus three times calls Satan the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. He calls him that in John. Uh, I just gave you the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that Paul calls Satan the god of this world. John, the apostle John, in 1 John chapter 5 calls Satan this. He says this, the whole world lies in the power of what? The evil one. So here's the question. How can you love a system that is ruled and governed by Satan while confessing that you love the Lord Jesus Christ? You can't love Satan's system. You can't do it. It's, here's a word. It's antithetical. It goes against everything that you say you profess and believe. Mm, that's good. And if you don't understand that, you got bigger problems than just loving the world. <laughs> you got a salvation problem. Uh -oh. mm. You can't do that. Also, it tells us that we can't love the world, number one, because we're no longer of it. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says, if then you have been raised up with Christ, then you should be seeking those things that are above. Now somebody tell me, why should I be seeking those things that are above? Because I've been raised up with Christ. If I've been raised up with Christ, I should be seeking those things where I've been raised up at. Where Christ sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. And here's what he talks about. How do we seek those things that are above? By setting our minds 
on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. You get it? Remember over in Matthew chapter 16 when Peter, when Jesus is telling the disciples that I'm going to be going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be uh, 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 crucified, I'm going to die there. And what does Peter do? Peter then pulls Jesus to the side and said, oh no, Lord, let it not be so. Let this not be so. And what does Jesus say? Man, thank you, man. I'm glad you love me like that. Man, that is so awesome, man, man, man. Peter, you really touched me. No, Jesus looks at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. But watch this. We miss this. We love to use that verse to, to, to think we can rebuke the devil. No, he says, get thee behind me, Satan, for you savoreth not the things of God, but the things of man. You get it? How was Satan operating? Just in Peter naturally not wanting Jesus to die. But in Peter wanting that, it goes against the will of God. You get it? Man, it's, 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 so we seek those things where Christ is. We set our minds on things above. We're not like Peter. We don't set our things on the things of man. <coughs> for verse 3 tells us in Colossians chapter 3 verse 3 for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God Colossians 1.13 says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred <coughs> us to the kingdom of his beloved son so why don't we love the world because we're no longer of it we're no longer of it we're no longer of it so and then two we go back to 1 John chapter 2 here's the big one it says, love not the world or the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How about that one? John Piper, what did we say last week? Says the love of God pushes out the, I'm sorry, the love of the world pushes out the love of the Father. The two can exist in the same heart. As a believer, we will be tempted by the world. We will be tempted. But James tells us that, 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 that we all draw, every man is tempted when he is drawn in his own lust. Then when lust, when it is conceived in the heart, it bears forth sin. So and here's the deal, what I'm trying to say. It's not wrong for us to be tempted. As long as we live in this world, we're going to be tempted. But when we take that fire into our bosom, like Proverbs says, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? You know, what's the old additive, Mom? You play with a puppy, it'll lick your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. You can't play with sin. Mm -hmm. Because here's the deal. If you play with a little bit of the world, what does it say? Listen to James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Mm -hmm. Therefore, notice what he says. Do you not know? You get that? Do you not know? James is like, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? For the born again believer, that should be enough, Auntie Linda. Put your hand up if you want to be an enemy of God. When you know what the Bible says God's going to do to his enemies. I like what James says. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. In other words, James says, do you not know this? Are, are you forgetting that the scripture says that God is jealous for the spirit that he has placed in us? In other words, he will not share his glory with another. The Bible makes it crystal clear that the Lord Jesus Christ will not compete for the throne of your heart against the world. You're not going to pit Jesus up against the world. And then he got to do more for you than this world going to do for you. 
Okay, let's see what you're going to do, Jesus, because I know what I can do here. But I try Jesus. That's why you should get out of that language, trying Jesus. You, if you're going to say you're going to try Jesus, you may as well just forget that. Because Jesus is not, he's, he's not some, some deal that you try. He's the supreme God. He's God in the flesh. He's your Lord and Savior. He's your Lord, your master. You are his slave. He's not something that you try. And that's exactly what, that's what, that's what James is talking about. You can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God. To put yourself to be a friend of the world is to make yourself an enemy of God. So we can't love the world. Why? Because if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. It's to, we're committing spiritual adultery against God. But in the last week, we talked about do not love the things in the world. So we talked about don't love the world because of what it is. The world is the system of Satan. We can't love the world because the love of the world, the love of the Father is in us. We can't love the world because we've been taken out of the world. But then it talks about not loving the things of the world. That's verse 16. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. I like this, guys, because I told you if you take out the dashes or the hyphen, you see the hyphen there? It says, for all that is in the world, hyphen, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. When you see something written like that, what does that mean? That, that, that's like a, for all that is in the world. Then that what's after the hyphen is telling you all that is in the world. What's all in the world? The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Hyphen is not from the Father, but from the world. Here's how you can read that. If you take out the hyphen part, here's how the statement reads in the Greek. For all that is in the world is not from the Father, but from the world. Everything the world offers you is from the world. It's not from the Father. The Father does not offer you the things of the world. The Father does not offer the fallen human heart what it always wants. Why would God offer you wealth and riches when that's what everybody on the planet is searching for? Why? And you'll see why I'm saying this as we go to this last verse. Because see, it's easy to say, okay, I don't love this evil system. I, I get that. It is evil. It's easy to say that while our hearts are just entangled in the, in the things. And I told you guys, this is where I believe that the devil does his best work. He gets us entangled in the things, guys. It's not the things of the world that are inherently evil. It's our relationship to the things in the world that drives our desires, affects our emotions, and steal our affections away from Christ. It's always the things in the world that end up stealing our affections from Christ. It's always that way. It's always that way. And notice that we says, said this on last week. The phrase, all that is in the world, is a comprehensive statement. All that is in the world. Everything in the world. Nothing missing. Everything that's in this world system of evil. If the world system of evil created it, fathered it, guess what? It's not of God. Because what's of the world system? The desires of the flesh. We talked about that last week. The desires of the flesh are the things of the world. Listen to this. Seducing the inner passions of your soul away from Christ. What are the desires of the flesh? The desires of the flesh are, your Bible may say, the lust of the flesh, are the things of the world. Seducing the inner passions of your soul away from Christ. It is the flesh that perverts the things of the world that are then used to drive the heart away from the Christ. Y'all follow it? The things of this world, I want to be sure I'm very clear on this, the things of this world are not inherently evil. You get that? The things in the world are not inherently evil. But what happens is the flesh, your flesh, my flesh, 
perverts the things of the world that, that are then used to drive my heart away from Christ. Okay, y'all follow it. The things of the world ain't the problem. What's the problem? There you go, Lindsay. I'm the problem. I'm the one with the sin nature. I'm the one with a lust problem. <laughs> I'm, and what do I mean by lust? We learn from Eve, I want more. I love this, man. I was listening to some messages today from Charles Spurgeon. And when you listen to messages from Charles, it's just somebody reading the message. But it was so good because what he was talking about is that, 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 that sin always began with some type of gain for self. How do you know you in sin? You want something more of. Oh, man, you, I, that's a good thing to think about. Because how do you get Eve, who has no sin nature, you get her to want something more than what God has already given? That's how it begins. Th that's the seed, Lindsay, that's placed in the heart. And then right after the... Now, I haven't sinned yet, but that's the thing that's germinating it. Because then after it gets to the lust of my flesh, then it goes to the desires of the eyes. What is that? The desires of the eyes are the things of the world seducing the pleasure, the, uh, seducing you, taking you, filling you with the pleasures of the world. So what do I mean by that? When you think of the eyes, it is the external pleasures of this world that begin to allure the mind away from the sufficiency of Christ. You begin to see it. See yourself with it. Seeing how it can make you better. Seeing how, man, if I could just get this, if I could just do that, if I could do... See, all of that is how the lusts of the eyes work. The system of evil that is the world uses the things of the world to paint this satisfying and fulfilling life that comes from the abundance of things. Man, would you even be lusting out the things if the people who had it just lived, look, look, like, look like crack addicts? <laughs> no. I like what one guy said. Who would be a drug dealer if all the drug dealers were broke? <laughs> Why would you ever start a, a cocaine cartel if all the thing they was making is about 10 bucks an hour? No. So what do you do? How does Satan do that? He glorifies it, whether it be in movies, shows, sitcoms. Come on, think about all the sitcoms you watch, whether it's Power, whether it was uh, 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 Empire, whether what the people went pro. <laughs> Sinful, but definitely one bro. That's the lust of the eyes. That's how it works, guys. This incites your sinful passions to want this life for yourself and to do whatever it takes to get it now. And then that leads to the pride of life. I like what it says in the King James, the boastful pride of life. The pride of life are the things of the world bringing you, uh, making you believe that they're, it's bringing you security, authority, power, and influence. This phrase, the pride of life in the Greek means boasting, bragging, swagger, vainglory, showing off. The, it's trusting in the stability of earthly things. Man, now that I've made enough money, now that I've satisfied myself, man, we're good to go. We are good to go. I can now relax, man. I can now pour myself into the church, man. I can now pour myself into the Bible, man. I can now accept that call into the ministry. Man, I can now do this. I can now do this because, man, I've secured some stuff. Oh, fool, this night your soul is required of you. I love, I love the, I, you know, I've been in Proverbs always as well, but now I'm in Ecclesiastes, and I told you, if you want to understand the Bible, the book of Proverbs is this, that God rewards the righteous, and he, and, and he curses the wicked. That's the overall picture of Proverbs. That's why it seems like the, the, the righteous are blessed. Not. But you want to know what Ecclesiastes is about? Under the sun, it don't operate like that. Because I love what Solomon says, man, I see a, a grievous thing under the sun. I see a man who is righteous, and, and man, he, he, his days are cut short. I see a guy who's wicked, and he lives long, prosperous days. Mm. Solomon says, here's what I begin to understand. The righteous and the wicked 
both die the same under the sun. Now, under the sun, in the earth, the righteous and the wicked gonna die. <laughs> the difference in the righteous is they have eternal life waiting for them and the life to come. That's the hope. You gotta see it. The unbeliever has no hope. Watch this. Their hope is only in this world. That's why we say, guys, one of the most ridiculous and sinister books ever written by somebody supposing to be a preacher is a, is a book entitled Your Best Life Now. I don't know if you understand how sadistic and satanic that is. This preacher of the so-called gospel who is no preacher, who is a false prophet, an agent of Satan, has a book called Your Best Life Now. If this is your best life now, then that means the life that is to come is going to be in hell. Mm -hmm. Because every born again believer knows my best life is to come. That's right. Every believer knows that. And that's the hope of every child of God. Mm -hmm. But if your hope is to live your best life now, then baby, I'm, I'm here. Go ahead and live it up. You better get all you can out of this life because your next one to come is going to be pretty bad. <laughs> so, let's look at the last verse, verse 17. And the world, here's the, here's the year, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now listen to this, guys. Here's the summary of what of John's argument thus far. This is good because this, this is why we have Bible study, so you can understand how to see these verses. John is making an argument. What does the argument begin with, Lindsay? Do not love the world or the things in the world. Okay, that's that's that. So the next question would be, well, why not? Mm -hmm. Well, number one, because of what it is. Don't love the world because of what it is. It's this ordered system of evil that influences the culture, the ideologies, the philosophies, the attitudes, the opinions, the norms, the values, the beliefs, all ruled and under the authority of Satan. So number one, you don't love the world because of what it is. Number two, you don't love the world because of what it does to the believer. What does it do? It incites sin. It, in, it incites the evil that is inherently in our fallen nature. It allures us through our lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. It draws us away from Christ. Well, now John is making his final reason on why we're not to love the world or the things in it. He's now going to the third reason, which is this, where it is going. The world and its desires are passing away. Now watch this. Please remember that when John says the world is passing away along with his desires, he's still talking about the ordered system. Now, he's not talking about still the creation or, or the humanity. Now, we do know, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, that even creation will pass away. Remember that? How do we know that? God says he's going to make a new what? A new heaven and a new earth. That's Revelation chapter 20. So, but that's not, I want you, we want to stay in context. In context, John is not talking about the world of creation here. We also know that the world of humanity, that is going to pass away. That at the, at the return of Christ, all sinners will be destroyed. We know that. But that's not what John is talking about here. He's still talking about that ordered system of evil. The phrase now, is passing away, is one Greek verb that means to depart, to go away, to disappear. Now listen to this. Furthermore, that verb there is passing away. See, in our English, it's three words. It's passing away. In the Greek, it's one verb. That verb is written what is known in the present indicative passive. Now, again, that's grammar. Why did I say that? Because when you find a Greek word or verb that is written in the present indicative passive, this is a verb that is action that is in the process of being. So it's action that is in motion. You see what I mean? It's not something that has been acted upon or something that will act, Elder Charles. 
It's a verb. Y'all know what a verb is. Verb is an action. This Greek verb is a verb that is in the process. So what that means for us is that when we really want to interpret this verse, it says, because the world is in the process of passing away from existence. So why don't you love the world or the things in it? Because the world is in the process of passing away. The entire ordered system of evil that incites sin and corrupts civilization is in the process of destroying itself. The world is like a cancer. It is eating its own body. <laughs> the world system of evil is killing itself. Think about what we see today in the world. The world is destroying itself. Cities in America are destroying themselves. Maybe you haven't been keeping up with current events, but the crime is absolutely out of control Amen. in all of your major cities. That's right. That's the truth. They are robbing people. One lady got her car robbed while she was washing it. In front of it. In front of it. With the little thing, yeah. the dude came and jumped in the car and drove off. You're like, my God. She's pretty water. <laughs> People are getting shot. We talked about the guy here in Atlanta jogging, shot. Call the police. I've been shot. They said, "Well, is the cell is still there." I don't know. I've been shot. Would you send somebody? What are you talking about? I just been shot. Well, what were you doing? Just jogging. Yeah. Well, man, here's the deal. This pro this world system is in the process of destroying itself. But I don't know if you guys get this, because here's how you have to understand the Bible. When did John say this? <laughs> John said this in the first century. <laughs> so that system was in the process of destroying itself. So it was true in John's day, and it's true in the 21st century. You see how the Bible is transcendent? <laughs> it's amazing. We can read this, and we're just, oh, that's just for the first century. Well, what about our day today? It's destroying itself right now. And John said, oh, it's destroying itself then. What that's letting us know is every age that the devil is in control of, which is all of them, they're under his authority and rulership now. The age, not the creation. God is in control of the creation. You follow what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the devil is in control of the age, the heir of the age. Every last one of them destroys themselves. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Listen to what it says. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Watch this. Look at verse 13. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The, in verse 13, if you have a King James, it probably uses the word wax. It probably says evil people will wax worse. The word wax in the ESV is translated will go on. It is another Greek verb and it means to advance, to make progress. Literally, the world continue, as the world continues, the evil that is within it advances in wickedness from age to age. Do y'all get that? Do y'all get that? Each age of wickedness becomes more wicked than the previous age. Would you guys believe that? Would you say, let's, we don't have to go back far, would you just say that the 90s were more wicked than the 80s? The 2000s were more wicked than the 90s. The teens, the 2010 to 2020, was pretty bad. We've already started 2021 off with a bang. You see? So I think we can just look at that little short span there and see how it's worse. It's worse. It's worse. The world, I like this, man. One theologian said it like this. The world is in a death spiral. It is headed straight for destruction 
and it is in the continual process of collapsing in on itself. <laughs> One theologian put it like this, the world is like a black hole. <laughs> it, it, it is just, it is closing in on itself. When we think about that, when we talk about the world, man's world, man's government, man's ideology, man's glory, man's wisdom, the entire kingdom that man has built for himself under the influence of Satan is in the process of destroying itself. This is why we say all the time there is no good news to the world. The good news or the gospel is to the people that are held captive in the world. Amen. God does not give good news to the American dollar. Mm. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> we can relate to this. There's no good news to the housing market. There's no good news to financial investments. There's no good news to the democratic process. There's no good news for the presidency, for the Senate, for social justice, for aid, for war. There's no good news given to the culture. The good news is to the people that are enslaved to the culture. We share the good news to the people. The gospel is to the people that Jesus delivers you out of the system. Mm -hmm. And how does he deliver you out of it? By putting you to death in his death. You die to the system and you become alive in him. And now watch this. I love Romans 8. You are no longer in debt to the flesh. You are no longer in debt to your desires, in debt to your lust. You don't owe the world anything. The only thing you owe the world is the gospel to the people of the world. This is why I say, if your heart is still entangled in the world as it is collapsing in on itself, you'll go down in flames with it. Furthermore, watch this, if your heart is still entangled with the things of the world, then Satan, the ruler of the world, will always have an open door in your life. How does he have an open door? To the things in the world. The things. That's his open door. Because when you feel those things starting to get a little shaky, then guess what? You're going to run, run back to the world. Let me read some. Everybody turn here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want you to see this because you'll think we made this up. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to just read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 25. Everybody turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 25. I'm going to read verses 25 through 31. Okay? Listen to these verses. I want everybody to listen up to them. You follow along, but listen. Keep your mind focused in on this thing. It says now, now remember, 1 Corinthians 7 is written to what? This is a message about marriage. And he starts in verse 25. He says, now concerning the betrothed, betro I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. In other words, Paul says, I'm giving you this judgment by my role as, the, as an apostle. Verse 26, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. In other words, Paul says, in view of the present distress, I think it's good for people to remain single. Now, why is he talking about that? What is the present distress? Well, if you go study out what was going on in Corinth, during this time, you have Nero who's on the throne. The present distress was the persecution that was breaking out against the Christians. So Paul is like saying, look, because of this present distress, because of this pers persecution breaking out, it probably would be best for you to remain single. Because you don't want to have this persecution breaking out, now you got to deal with a new bride at the same time. All you got to deal with this, you can run better. 
<laughs> when you're by yourself. Honestly, don't, this is what this is talking about. He says this, verse 27, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. In other words, don't divorce her. If you, are you free from a wife? If you're not married, don't seek one. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And it says, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Wow. <laughs> wow. Being married brings on worldly troubles. We're going to get there. <laughs> this is what I mean, brothers. The appointing time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn and who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Why? For the present form of this world is passing away. Wow. <laughs> There it is. There it is. And look at verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties, worries. For the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things. What are the worldly things? How to please his wife. Wow. <laughs> So me being concerned with how to please Lindsay is a worldly thing. But watch this. Look at this. And his interests are divided. So being married is a product of the... Okay, God, it's an institution of God that he ordained in Genesis chapter 2. But now the way the system is because of the fall, we went over that on Sunday, and what it does, it has now made it a worldly thing that tugs on your flesh. You want to know if you want, you don't know if you say get married. You want to know who can get you mad? Your spouse. Your spouse can turn you into Satan incarnate. <laughs> because your interests are divided and the unmarried or the betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord how to be holy in body and spirit but the married woman is anxious about worldly things what's the worldly things that she's anxious about how to please her husband how to, make, how to fix dinner how to, how to do stuff for you all those things are worldly things and I say this to your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Even marriage, guys, can tug your heart and cause your interest to be divided from Christ. The Bible is so good when you, can, when you really understand it. That's true. What these verses are saying is that everything that concerns our lives in this world system, Lindsay, is passing away. Everything. Including, watch this, the lives that we live in this present world is all passing away. Have you ever thought about that? Even your marriage is in the process of passing away. Because every day you guys stay married, you and her are both closer to death. Life is a terminal illness. You come into this world on a pathway to die. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever sit back to think about that? Are you too busy listening to the prosperity people? No, I'm saying, have you ever just sat back to think, Everything that I hold dear in this world that's a part of this system is going to pass away. Jesus says that when I'm in heaven, I'm going to be like the angels. I'm not even going to be married or given to marriage. Even the things that we love and that are done out for the joys of Christ, fatherhood, motherhood, those things are passing away. Oh, man, that... 
The only thing that has eternal value in this present world system is the life that is to come in Jesus. This is why it goes back to Martha, Martha. Thou art worried, Luke chapter 10, and troubled about many things. But there is one thing that is needful. And Mary has chosen the good portion. And it shall not be taken from her. What had Mary chosen? To sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. You want to know the one eternal thing that you want to do? Is to learn of Christ. Do you realize what you're learning of Christ right now? You're going to take it into eternity. Do you realize all that you are working yourself to the bone to accomplish in this earth? It's going to go to the grave. And I like what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. He says, you work all that hard, and when you die, another person gets it. And he may not be a good steward over all that you worked hard for. Mm -hmm. So you worked hard to leave it to your family, find out that you gave it to your son, and he squandered a doggone thing and blew the business to, to, to smithereens. Think about that for me. The most important thing is taking time out to come and learn of Christ. But that is the very thing, watch this mom, we just don't have time for. Because our focus is on the things of this world. And all of that is passing away. The word present form in the Greek is schema. It literally is the exterior shape. That word, when it says the present form, it's literally talking about the exterior shape, the external and outward form. The external and outward form that is this life that we're currently living in this world is passing away. This external life is passing away. This external life, the life that you see right now that I'm doing is passing away. I will not be inspected in heaven. You won't be working in a call center. Lizzie won't be teaching the kids. <laughs> Ain't no post office. You, are you getting what I'm saying? All of these things are passing away. But these are the very things that we dedicate and entangle our hearts to. <laughs> that we will forsake Christ for in order to gain more of even though it's passing away can y'all get how foolish that is of us to do watch this I wrote this down this is why the prosperity gospel is not only false but it is dangerous why because it gets you focused it focuses your entire Christian journey on this present world you want to know why the prosperity gospel is so dangerous, so false, so satanic? Because it gets you to focus on this world. It gets you consumed with the comforts and the pleasures of this temporal life. You have people who have dedicated their entire ministry to marriage. There's nothing wrong with talking about marriage in the context of the scripture. Your ministry should be dedicated to the Bible. And when we get to the passages that talk about marriage, you talk about marriage. But to just forego a gospel ministry and all you do is talk about marriage, which is going to pass away. That doesn't make any sense. The Bible has plenty to say about marriage. As you get to those passages, as you're expositing the scripture, but to just dedicate my whole ministry to prosperity. How foolish is that? When that money is going to pass away. And what it does is, guys, it diminishes the hope of the eternal life that is to come. Well, to be honest with you, most believers have no expectation for the life that is to come because they're too busy trying to get it right here. Look at, go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at this verse here, verses 9 through 18. 
2 Timothy chapter 4. This is a closing statement from Paul. Y'all got it? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9 through 18. It says, this is Paul. Now, I want you to think about this. When you think about 2 Timothy, what is this? This is the last letter of Paul. This is written around A.D. 62, A.D. 63, perhaps. Paul is getting ready to go to the chopping block. Now, watch this. Here's what he says. He's writing to Timothy. Do your best. And I want to read it how I can picture him writing it. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Croesus is gone to Galatea and Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me and for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left in Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through my message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles that all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you understand this is written by a man who's getting ready to get his head chopped off? But the way he's talking about it, man, I'm about to be delivered. Mm. Can you see? Do you, do you hear any hint of a guy who's in love with the world? Mm. He's getting ready to get his head chopped off, Mom. And he said, the Lord strengthened me. I've been delivered out of the, mind, the lion's mouth. Somebody would look at him in the eye and say, man, you ain't delivered out. You're still in prison. Because what we think is deliverance is getting out of the situation. Wow. Paul looks at it totally different because his heart isn't entangled in the world. Would this be your testimony? All deserted me. <laughs> or would your letter be cussing out for me? I ain't got nothing to say to y'all. Good luck. I made it, you make it now. No. This is a guy who gives a doxology. As his head is going to be laid on the chopping block and roll 14 paces down Nero's steps. Mm. Does that sound like the best life now? Mm. You think Peter lived his best life now getting crucified upside down? Or maybe Thomas lived his best life now getting a spear thrown at him as he's preaching the gospel. Or maybe James lived his best life now as Herod killed him. Or maybe John the Baptist got a chance to live his best life now as his head was served on a platter to a daughter. It should anger you when you hear these false prophets talk today because they're liars and it totally defames the message of the gospel. Because look at verse 10. Demas, having loved this present age, has deserted me. Did you, I, I, you, did you, you didn't miss that, did you? Watch this, guys. What this Remember, the word there for love is agapio. What this means in the context is that Demas <clears throat> never severed his attachments and entanglements to the world. Demas loved the ease and safety and comforts he once had enjoyed in the world more than he loved the hard, difficult, and often painful life that follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is in prison waiting for his execution, not his breakthrough. Demas most likely saw the handwriting on the wall and went back to where his heart had never left. You get it? Paul's getting ready to die. Demas probably said, man, let me find the exit. <laughs> that means the whole time, Kevin, because if you go, we don't have time. If you go study Colossians and go look at those books, you will see Demas' name in the closing. Paul says, oh, Timothy is here with me. Luke is here with me. And Demas, my fellow worker. Demas is here. I'm sending Demas. You see Demas all. And at the end of Paul's life, the whole time, 
There's demons in the background. He feeling all antsy because he still love the world. He 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 waiting on the conquering to happen. He waiting to get the goods. <clears throat> he waiting to see how this thing gonna go. And once he see, okay, this ain't looking good. Paul look like he about to die. Let me go on back to Thessalonica. I like what one commentator says. Although Thessalonica was apparently the home of demons, he most likely went back there because it was a great merchant center and all his business connections were there. And he preferred them, the rich and prosperous friends, over Paul, the condemned and dying prisoner. And look at this. The word deserted is a strong Greek word and it means to leave in a lurch. To abandon, to forsake. Demons just didn't desert Paul. He left him in a lurch. He abandoned him when Paul needed his friends the most. Mm. Demons deserted his post as a fellow worker with Paul for the gospel because he never <coughs> severed his love for the world. I'm using this to close for a purpose. If you don't think you can play around with the world, well, that's demons. That'll never happen to me. Demons hung out with Paul. He hung out with Luke. He hung out with Mark, who wrote the gospel of Mark. How about y'all know demons was around some pretty heavy hitters? I don't think if demons can't survive it, you can't survive it being around Sarah, unsaved, your, 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 your wicked grandmama, your best friend who are drunk, your worldly co-workers, but you're going to survive. You ain't going to be a demon. No, demons never severed his love to the world. So guess what? It called him back. He wasn't like Moses who says, by faith, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproaches of Christ's greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Moses forsook the wealth of Egypt for the reproaches of Christ, whereas Demas forsook the reproaches of Christ for the wealth of this present age. As we close this little series, where's your heart? Because the scripture says the world is passing away along with all of its desires. As the Holy Spirit transforms, how, how do the desires are passing away? Even our desires are passing away. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is working and sanctifying work in our hearts. As the Holy Spirit is doing his work in his heart, guess what he's doing? It should be pulling your attachments away from the world. How do you know the Holy Spirit is actually at work in your heart? It's actually pulling you away from the world. How do you know the Holy Spirit is not working in your heart? I'm falling more in love with the world. I'm right where I started when I first got saved. I haven't, I haven't changed a bit. The same passions I had when I said yes to Jesus, I still got the same passion and I want it all. Maybe a little bit of Christ mixed in when I got time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you need to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because look at the last part of it. In 1 John 2, 17, it says, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's us. That's the believer. Mm -hmm. That's the believer, guys. Mm -hmm. That's us. We don't love the world because we're, we're of the people who do those things that are going to abide forever. Is the world going to tempt us? Come on. Yes, it is. Is this going to be something that you have to do every day? Yes. Because what did we say when we first started the message? It says, do not be continually not loving the world. In other words, this is something you have to do every day. Who told you the Christian life was easy? Who told you that? Here's the deal. They're lying. The, I mean, the Christian, they're lying if they told you it was not easy. But, I mean, that is easy. Because the scripture says, straight and narrow is the road that leads to life. That word narrow is compacted with pressure. The Christian life can be painful. It can be lonely. It can be misconstrued. It can be misunderstood. It can be a life of rejection. But guess what?
guess what, guys? It has hope that is to come because it promises you eternal life. It promises you to reign with Christ when he returns. Why would you forsake that for the pleasures of possibly the 70 or 80 years you get here? What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I hope this series has made you think. Because as we get more and more closer in these, the return of Christ, it's going to be so important that our hearts are out of this world. It's going to be tempting, guys. It's going to be very difficult. We're going to need each other. Amen. You're going to need your church family. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about some video online. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about some online church. I'm talking <laughs> about you're going to need the fellowship. The scripture says, for forsake not the assembling of the brother when there's some do. Watch this. Knowing that the day draws near. As the day of the return of Christ draws near, do not forsake the assembly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're going to need your brothers and sisters in Christ mm. to help keep you grounded. You're going to have to know how to call up one of your brothers and sisters and say, hey, man, this world is black. I feel like Demas. <laughs> <laughs> Demas knocked on my door last night. And he said, come on back with me. <laughs> I, just, I just need you to pray with me. You cannot be prideful enough not, not to do this now. Because, guys, the devil is taking all the gloves off. He's got a whole system at his disposal, and it's getting it's getting more deceptive. And not only that, we have that one scripture in Second Thessalonians that tells us God is going to bring a strong delusion on the world. So, guys, let's not play around with this. Let's get our hearts with. If you know you need to do this, pray to the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, work your sanctifying work in me. And trust me, God is not going to just snatch it from you all at once. That's not how He works. But he knows how to pull your heart away from it as he draws you closer to Christ. It is Christ that pulls you. It is your love for him that constrains you and pulls you away. Amen? Amen. 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 So that's how it works. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that's it, guys. Uh, thank you guys for joining with us. Uh, we hope to see you on Sunday as we continue our series in Revelation. Go Hawks. Uh, we hope that they... Don't embarrass us tonight, but we got, you know, they're playing good. So we hope we see a good series with them, and uh, we want to uh, hope we can see you guys as well. You know, I hope nobody cut out a Bible study at that church just to go watch the Hawks. So we want to make sure we're still, <laughs> we're still loving the Lord. So we want to thank you guys. We'll see you on Sunday. Also, I want to take the time, wish my sister a happy birthday. Uh, it's her birthday today, so we want to wish her happy birthday just in case she watches the broadcast. And so we want to uh, uh, thank her for all the service she does here. And we want to wish her a good, happy, and prosperous birthday. Thank you. God bless you.